Good morning, students. Uh, this is Dr. Mitra from the Department of Conservative Dentistry and Endodontics, uh, Sri Balaji Dental College and Hospital. And I'm here to present a short topic to you. Uh, we are going to see in detail the difference in tooth preparation between uh, class two inlay and amalgam. So going over to the presentation. So it's going to be in detail about the difference in tooth preparation uh, between class two inlay and amalgam. So the contents of the class is going to be a brief introduction wherein we are going to see the definition of inlay and onlay. We are going to see the general steps in fabrication for an inlay restoration. We are also going to see in detail the steps in tooth preparation for a class two inlay. And we are going to see in, uh, about the difference in the tooth preparation uh, between inlay and amalgam. So coming to the introduction, so what is an inlay? Inlay is an intracoronal restoration that is fabricated extraorally and it is cemented and looted onto the prepared tooth. So please remember an inlay may cover one or more cusps to protect the weakened cusp, but not all the cusps on the occlusal surface. Whereas an onlay is an intracoronal restoration that is used to cover all the cusps and it is uh, fabricated extraorally and it is cemented onto the prepared tooth. So please remember an inlay is an intracoronal restoration that is designed to cover one or more cusps, but not all the cusps on the occlusal surface. Uh, whereas an onlay is again an intracoronal restoration that is fabricated extraordinarily and it is cemented looted onto the prepared tooth that is designed to cover all the cusps on the particular uh, tooth on which it is going to be cemented. So if you see the picture here, so this is an example of an inlay, a class two inlay. And this is a, a picture of a, a onlay, okay, with the ceramic facing, wherein it is covering the entire tooth structure, all the cusps on the occlusal surface. Coming to the, uh, just to explain or just to recollect the stages in the fabrication of a cast metal inlay and onlay, the first step is the tooth preparation. So once the tooth preparation is completed, whatever the inlay or onlay, whether it's class one or whether it is class two, once the tooth preparation is completed, the next step is you will take an impression. The impression here is most commonly taken with putty and light body, additional silicone, putty and light body, or alginate can also be used, but most ideally you have to use a putty and light body. So once the impression is taken, you fabricate the master cast. Once the master cast is fabricated, uh, two wax patterns are taken. Please remember, as far as an inlay and onlay is concerned, two wax patterns are taken. The wax pattern, which is taken directly from the patient's mouth from the prepared cavity will be the direct wax pattern. The indirect wax pattern is the one which is taken in the dental lab that is taken by the dental technician or from the master cast. Now, once the wax pattern is obtained, whether it is a direct pattern or whether it's an indirect wax pattern, the next step is you uh, uh, place the mold, uh, the wax pattern inside this crucible former and then here is your wax pattern. So you assemble it in the casting ring. You have your casting ring uh, liner. You have your sprue and uh, your sprue former and below is your crucible former. So once it is placed in the casting ring, you have to pour your investment material. So once it sets and once it hardens, the next step is you have to place the casting ring along with this um, invested uh, wax pattern uh, directly into the furnace wherein the wax is the wax is melted out and this uh, place is created empty so that the next step the mold for the casting is created the next step is the metal casting procedure wherein whatever the casting machine is used most probably the centrifugal casting machine is used wherein uh, whichever alloy is used whether it is a cast metal alloy most commonly for inlays and onlays we use cast metal alloys which are basically our base metal alloys Sometimes very rarely auden alloys are also used. Sometimes gold can also be used. So whatever the metal, it is melted and it is uh, casted by using the centrifugal casting machine and it takes up the shape of the uh, wax pattern. So once it is obtained, once the casting procedure is completed, uh, the entire assembly is kept on the bench for cooling. So once the cooling is completed, slowly the casting is broken down from the casting ring and is taken out. Next, you do the uh, extra, extra oral finishing and polishing that is done by the technician in the lab. So once that is done, you try the uh, casting onto the patient's mouth, uh, onto the tooth preparation in which you have completed. 
and you cement the prepared casting, the inlayer only, onto the prepared tooth by using your type 1 GAC rooting cement. So that is the procedure, the overall procedure for placement of your inlay and onlay. And the final finishing and polishing is completed in the patient's mouth. So if you see in the tooth preparation, certain important things has to be kept in mind. So uh, bevels are placed on the cable surface margin for an inlay of an onlay. So this beveling that is placed in the cable surface margin uh, allows a thin margin of metal to overlap or encompass the tooth structure. Thereby it strengthens the remaining tooth structure. So the bevels are given for an inlay and onlay on the occlusal cable surface margin, as well as the gingival bevels are also placed. So let us briefly see the steps in uh, class two inlay cavity preparation. So the first step is when there is a extensive class two caries lesion involving one particular proximal surface, or it can be a MOD cavity. So depending upon the extent of caries, you first the Ideal burr that is used for your inlay preparation is your 271 burr. It is a tungsten carbide burr. So you take your 271 burr and then you give your punch cut on that part of the occlusal surface which is affected by caries. And then you define your class two cavity. Extend the burr uh, uh, to whichever proximal surface is involved. Leave a very thin uh, portion of your enamel um, so that uh, don't break this uh, thin portion of enamel with the burr. If you break it with a the burr, there's chances of damaging the adjacent tooth structure. So never do that. So ideally, you should leave a thin portion of the enamel there. And ideally, you have to use an enamel hatchet and break that enamel. And then you uh, extend for your grooves. If your dovetail is needed on the upper surface, give your dovetail. So you extend the burr onto the uh, weakened margin ridge then you prepare your class one, uh, class two cavity. So first you establish your initial pulpit depth. Uh, so ideally for an inlay, the depth of the cavity will be around uh, 1.5 to 2 millimeter. The, uh, the same depth is established on the uh, entire occlusal surface. So first you finish the occlusal part of the cavity and then you will do the proximal box preparation. Now a proximal uh, ditch cut is made so as to prepare your proximal box with the same burr, your 271 burr is used to place your proximal ditch cut wherein you prepare your proximal box preparation and you uh, define your axial wall, you define your gingival seat. So once your proximal box is, is properly defined, you have to place your uh, bevel. A bevel is given on the gingival cable surface margin. So this is called as your gingival bevel. So you place your gingival bevel and you also achieve 0.5 mm clearance from the adjacent tooth. And one more important step in your class two inlay preparation is the placement of your dentive grooves. So use your 169 L burr. This is also a tungsten carbide burr. Use your 169 L burr, which is also a tungsten carbide burr, and place your retentive grooves on two line angles, buccal axial line angle and lingual axial line angle. So this, this picture, you're directly looking into the proximal box. Wherein, wherein you see your pulpit floor here, this is your axial wall and this is your gingival seat. So your 169 L burr is used to place your uh, retentive grooves on the buccal axial and lingual axial line angle. Then you use your uh, double, eight, uh, uh, double eight six two burr and place your occlusal bevel on the occlusal cable surface margin. So please remember for an inlay cavity or an onlay cavity, you have to place your um, cable surface bevel, occlusal bevel, gingival bevel, and one more bevel is placed internally. That is on the gingival seat sloping inwards towards axial wall here. So that bevel is called as a reverse bevel. So that we'll see that later. So once your tooth preparation is uh, completed, I've told you the steps. So you take the uh, wax pattern. So the wax pattern must be taken, direct wax pattern directly from the patient's mouth. And you also take an um, impression wherein you send it to the lab. And from the master cast, the indirect wax pattern is taken, the pattern is casted, and then the inlay is looted onto the prepared tooth by using your type 1 GIC. Supposing uh, it's a deep um, cavity, very close to the pulp, pulp protection is necessary. You can place your uh, calcium hydroxide as a cavity liner, and you can also use a GIC as a 
base over which your inlay can be looted onto the prepared tooth. Coming to the modifications in the class two inlay preparation. So there are two modifications. So this is the one which is uh, done in your mandibular uh, premolar because the lingual cusp is very, very small. So uh, very carefully you have to reduce the uh, lingual cusp, okay? And then you define, complete your preparation. And this is an, another modification in an upper molar uh, wherein two separate inlays are looted so as to preserve the oblique ridge. So oblique ridge is the strongest part of the tooth structure. Uh, so it is running from your uh, mesopactyl cusp to the distal buccal cusp. So uh, in, uh, in this type of operation, we are preserving the oblique ridge and creating two separate inlays. Coming to the only preparation, in only preparation, a slight variety is there, a slight modification is there. Uh, the most important step in the only preparation is that, you know, the, all the cusps are reduced and the restoration is going to cover all the cusps on the occlusal surface. So that is the only difference between inlay and onlay. In inlay, the restoration is going to cover one or more cusps, but not all the cusps. Whereas in an onlay, the restoration is going to cover all the cusps on the occlusal surface. So the first step in an only preparation is a cuspal reduction. So the cuspal reduction is done with the same bird, 271 bird. And uh, first you place your depth orientation grooves. So it is about 1.5 millimeter deep in your non-functional cusp. For example, if it's a mandibular molar, your functional cusps are the buccal cusp and the non-functional cusp are the lingual cusp. So uh, 1.5 mm clearance you should give for the non-functional cusp and 2 mm you should reduce for the functional cusp. 2 mm clearance you should give on the functional cusp. So once you place your uh, depth orientation groups, you can easily shave off the enamel and dentin in between. So thereby the cuspal reduction is completed both on the uh, in uh, both on the buccal as well as on the lingual surface. So the grooves help in uniform and accurate cutting. And while reducing the adjacent cusp, involve the buccal and the lingual developmental group. So this is important. So this is what is done, is shown in the picture here. The depth orientation groups are placed. And in between the dentin and the enamel is smoothened out. So once the occlusal reduction is completed, you have, uh, uh, the only cavity preparation is also done. So if it's, for example, if it's an MOD cavity, involving both the mesial and the distal, uh, distal surface. So you prepare your pulpit floor and two proximal blocks are prepared, one on the mesial side and the other one on the distal side. Same thing as for your uh, uh, class two inlay preparation, uh, the retentive grooves are placed on both the proximal boxes on the, uh, by using 169 L burr, it's also a tungsten carbide burr, on the buccoaxial line angle and on the linguaaxial line angle, the retentive grooves are placed. So this is a picture which is given in your student textbook, uh, which shows uh, the only is mainly uh, indicated to reinforce the remaining tooth structure. So generally the remaining tooth structure is badly broken down or fractured. So whatever the remaining cusps are there, they are reduced and the entire, um, all the five cusps on the occlusal surface. So this is a mandibular molar. So all the five cusps on the occlusal surface are completely uh, covered by the only preparation and if necessary, you can give like a uh, extension, okay? It can be a, a class one only along with the buccal extension, or it can be a class one only along with the lingual extension, depending upon the extent of the uh, caries. So this is nothing but a skirt and a collar preparation, which is shown here. Uh, so a skirt preparation is nothing but a bevel. It's called as a primary flare and it is called as a secondary flare. So, a, uh, uh, the skirt preparation is nothing but a bevel, which is placed external to the primary flare. Okay, it is a part of the secondary flare. Uh, it is nothing, uh, this allows a thin margin of uh, metal to encompass the weakened tooth structure. So let us go into detail about the difference in between uh, inlay and an amalgam cavity preparation. So that is the main part of the class. So let us see that in detail now. So here in an inlay preparation, the first difference is about the width of the cavity. So the width of the cavity for an inlay is one third of the intercuspal distance. So the outline form is basically wide when you see for an inlay. For an amalgam, the width of the cavity is one fourth of the intercuspal distance. So generally the outline form is narrow. Next is about the cavity depth. So the cavity depth for an inlay is comparatively less when compared to that of amalgam. 
for amalgam the cavity depth is more because amalgam has got strength only in bulk so uh, when you are uh, doing a class 1 or a class 2 amalgam restoration minimum you should have a 2 mm bulk of amalgam to withstand the masticatory stresses so the cavity depth is more for an amalgam coming to the third difference the uh, cavity walls for an inlay preparation are the, uh, are going to be diverging towards the occlusal surface so it is going to be divergent towards occlusal surface or sometimes it may be kept parallel same here for for an amalgam the cavity walls are going to be converging towards occlusal surface so this is inverted truncated shape of the cavity uh, because amalgam does not have any chemical adhesion to the tooth structure uh, it only has to lock into the cavity by uh, micromechanical uh, 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 by locking into the micro mechanical irregularity so you have to create that inverted truncated shape in order for the amalgam to be retained inside the prepared cavity so for an amalgam the walls are going to be convergent towards the occlusal surface whereas for inlay it is going to be divergent towards the occlusal surface coming to the buccal and the lingual walls of the proximal box for an inlay preparation the buccal and the lingual walls of the proximal box are kept parallel whereas for an amalgam the buccal and the lingual walls of the proximal box are also converging towards the occlusal surface coming to the uh, cavus surface margin the design of the cavus surface margin for an inlay and an amalgam as i as i already told you for an inlay preparation you have to give a cavus surface bevel a bevel is placed on the cavus surface margin so this bevel allows uh, 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 this is actually an obtuse angle of the tooth structure and an acute angle of the metal so uh, this allows a thin layer of metal to encircle that part of the weakened tooth structure it helps to reinforce the weakened tooth structure so a cavus surface bevel is given whereas for an amalgam the cavus surface bevel is uh, no bevel is indicated in the cavus surface it is a butt joint okay it is a 90 degree butt joint no bevel is given on the cavus surface margin here uh, coming to the sixth difference in an inlay all the line angles and point angles are well defined but as most important the axial pulpal line angle is slightly rounded so in, uh, look at this picture so here what you see here is the cavus surface bevel so in the fifth different this is the cavus surface bevel that is given in your inlay and what you see here for an amalgam is a butt joint 90 degree butt joint at the cavus surface margin so about the axial pulpal line angle in the sixth difference so this is your axial pulpal line angle so this is your pulpal floor this is your axial wall and this is your gingival seat So you see here the axial pulpal line angle is slightly rounded in an inlay preparation, whereas here in an amalgam all the line angles and point angles are rounded, and the axial pulpal line angle is bevel. A bevel is placed on the axial pulpal line angle. Coming to the uh, another important secondary retention and resistance feature given in a class two inlay preparation is a reverse bevel. so this bevel is given on the gingival seat sloping inwards towards the axial wall so this is the reverse bevel which is given on the gingival seat sloping inwards towards the axial wall so this is your pulpal floor this is your axial wall so the reverse bevel is given sloping inwards towards the axial wall so this is a secondary retentive and resistance feature which is given in your class 2 inlay preparation so the reverse bevel is indicated for an inlay here for a class 2 amalgam there is no reverse bevel coming to the uh, retentive features for an inlay on, uh, the retentive grooves are given retentive locks are not given for an inlay whereas for an amalgam the retentive grooves are not given only retentive locks are given for a amalgam uh, whatever the retentive groove or what if it's a retentive groove or if it's a retentive lock it is given on two specific line angles the buccal axial line angle and the lingual axial line angle coming to the uh, inlay preparation in a class 2 inlay preparation there is no reverse curve okay the reverse curve is not found in a inlay preparation whereas in an amalgam yes there is a reverse curve so the reverse curve is especially given in a class 2 amalgam especially in a premolar uh, wherein you preserve the healthy tooth structure and you slightly extend the extend the margin and you preserve as much as healthy tooth structure Okay, this is to maintain the strength of the surrounding uh, tooth structure. So a reverse curve is present in your class two amalgam. There is no reverse curve in your inlay. Here in your inlay, the proximal outline form is more extensive when compared to that of amalgam. 
here in your amalgam the uh, you just establish 0.5 mm clearance from the adjacent tooth the proximal outline form is not extensive in an inlay preparation only in a class 2 inlay preparation only you have your uh, in uh, in the proximal box of a class 2 inlay you have your primary flare you have your secondary flare you have your skirt you have your collar preparation all this makes the outline of the proximal box very much extensive whereas none of those features are there in your class 2 amalgam Coming to the gingival cable surface bevel, so I, as I told you, on the gingival seat, a, cable, a gingival cable surface bevel is given in a class two inlay. Uh, this is a uh, this is a, another uh, retentive feature. It helps to it helps to allow a thin margin of metal to reinforce the remaining tooth structure. Whereas in an amalgam, in a class two amalgam, so it is again a butt joint. A uh, gingival cable surface bevel is not given for a class two amalgam. Here inlay, the, uh, the restoration definitely supports the tooth structure. It helps to reinforce the remaining tooth structure. It helps to reinforce the weakened tooth structure. So overall it gives support to the tooth. Whereas for an amalgam, the amalgam restoration itself is only supported by the healthy, healthy tooth structure. Here the healthy tooth structure only supports the restoration. Coming to the isthmus, isthmus is nothing but the connection that is found between in a class two cavity. Isthmus is the junction between the occlusal part of the cavity and the proximal box. So this portion is the isthmus. Junction between the occlusal part of the cavity and the proximal box is called as the isthmus. So the isthmus basically for an inlay preparation is narrow. I mean, you see the isthmus in an inlay is narrow when compared to that of an amalgam. Whereas in an uh, amalgam, if you, uh, uh, depending upon the width of the occlusal surface and depending upon the width of the proximal box, the isthmus width is maintained proportionally. Suddenly it should not taper. If you keep the isthmus width uh, very narrow uh, in an amalgam, the restoration will fracture at the level of the isthmus. Here, the uh, uh, coming to the, uh, here the preparation is basically tapered. In an inlay, the preparation is basically tapered. So the retention is achieved by nearly parallel opposing walls uh, that allow the close adaptation of the casting onto the uh, whatever the material that you're going to use for looting or cementation. Here, the preparation is designed to create a retentive form. You create an inverted truncated shape of the cavity such that the uh, walls are uh, converging towards the surface, surface and help the amalgam to be retained in the cavity. The specific tooth preparation should retain the amalgam inside the prepared cavity. So this is about... Uh, in detail, we have seen about the differences, the broad differences between an inlay and an amalgam. I hope this class was useful for you. Thank you. Thank you for your patient listening.